Education is the development of the acumen for perspicacious evolution to the point where there is a degree of circumlocation in one's everyday interaction due to the desire to excogitate, therefore becoming sesquipedalian when it's quite transparently, obviously clear that all that has transpired is he is now saxico... saxico... he is now saxicolus. <laughs> Sometimes trying to sound educated can make it sound ridiculous. Let's face it, our education can be a great facelift. But without the all-round support of all cohorts and the child's better off outer space and case in a makeshift spaceship, only a fickle one thinks a finished curriculum makes the little ones educated. And we light a candle for the ones who life plans cancel, no one grief shift, moving from pacelift to pacelift. How could you feel validated just knowing you're just going through the paces? The secret is basic. Sometimes you look to the horizon and see no pastel sunset. Cloud cover pass, overcast, the entire class cast, spells cast, spell and getting you upset. An entire garden of crops yet to bear fruit. Fertilized by a curriculum model nowhere near truth. Well-rounded children placed into squares all day, all day here is square root. Education is supposed to take your places, but you have no idea where to. We should internalize, and in turn analyze every trend or bend or turn far and wide to see just how fast a past mark at the end of term could paralyze. Teachers in one hand arrive with tools in private schools that set the standard high, but in public schools on the other hand, a lie. A shortage of resources that set the plans awry. When we fall, then we call Henry Paul to Adonai. Even Dr. Nagera on YouTube tells that we're putting the youth through hell and expecting a destined paradise. Reading Macbeth and Hamlet, but can't understand that because our antenna picks up another bandwidth. Man, it's magnets for death row. Marks set to make you concentrate on your marks set. Let's go. A race to see who comes in first from the marks. Yes, let's go. And those who come in last, Get let go, fast, like presto. Right now, in this moment, there is a genius being told he's an idiot because he wasn't good at math. He was good at this, or wasn't good at that. Maybe good at risk, but not good at class. So let's look past the pass mark. Would you forego reading a novel and go straight to the last page? So why neglect the importance of process and go straight to a past grade? Let's look past the past mark. Overqualified. Now your name have too much letters. Now when they pronounce the pronoun you, it ain't sound too much better than if they pass gas. Let's look past the past mark. We may be a quality nation, but if we restructure our policy of qualification from top floor right down to brass tacks, then we look past the past mark. We don't invest in untapped art. So when we see the class clung, we can't see that he's a class act. Let's look past the pass mark. You think that these educators and policymakers won't be that daft? My, my, why build a wall between those who flags fly high and those who flags fly half mass? Let's look past the pass mark. The minute we limit the accountability of the ministry, we diminish the parent-teacher symmetry and it could only work half-half. Let's look past the pass mark. To the parents who think teachers bring to school bibs and maybe knickers for their kids for their is they believe that teachers are strangely babysitters know that it can only work half half let's look past the pass mark and i'll leave you with this if we raise in a generation of kids who only value how much they could retain and they only place value on how much memory they have remain then you could internalize and copy this we indeed raise in a generation of internal, external drives and floppy disks. Good evening again, ladies and gentlemen. Did you love that? Yes. For those who don't know, I'm Nicole Crook, Senior Manager, Human Resources, Industrial and External Relations at the Bank. A 
on behalf of the Governor, Board of Directors, Management and Staff of the Central Bank. It is my pleasure and honor to welcome you to the 32nd Dr. Eric Williams Memorial Lecture. The Honorable Prime Minister sends his regrets this evening, but he is very well represented by the Honorable Minister of Education, Minister Garcia. We welcome you and Mrs. Garcia this evening. We are honored. We are honored and appreciate the presence of other members of the Cabinet of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, Chief Secretary of the Tobago House of Assembly, Assemblyman Mr. Kelvin Charles, Your Excellencies, members of the Diplomatic Corps, members of the Judiciary, President of the Interreligious Organization, Reverend Dr. Nolly Clark and Mrs. Clark, Parliamentary Secretaries, Senator the Honorable Michael Knight, Mr. Nigel De Freitas, Vice President of the Senate, members of the Senate and the House of Representatives, representatives of international organizations, Governor of the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Alvin Hillier and Mrs. Sheila Hillier, Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Sandra Sukram, Chairman of the Public Service Commission, Mrs. Maureen Manchuk, Ombudsman of Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Patrick Wellington, Permanent Secretaries, Senior Government Officials and Heads of Department, Chairman of Statutory Boards and Authorities, Dr. Pietro Nogueira, our distinguished lecturer, and your sons, Joaquin, yeah? Joaquin and Antonio Nogueira, former Governor of the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Winston Ducaran, former Deputy Governor of the Central Bank, Ms. Joan John, family and friends of the late Dr. Eric Williams, students, teachers, and parents from Queens Royal College and St. Augustine Girls High School, staff and retirees of the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago, members of the media, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our lecture. I trust that you enjoy the invigorating spoken word piece by Mr. Idris Salim that opened the event. Idris is a member of the Two Cents Movement, a spoken word performance art group geared towards youth activism development, both locally and regionally. He's also a founding member of Demad Company, Drama Making a Difference, a drama-based NGO which uses theater to provoke thought and stimulate change. Our intention with his piece was to set the stage for a lecture that will leave us thinking differently about the education system as we know it today. Please permit me to make special mention of our set design and program, which were both deliberately fashioned by our graphic artists to represent a maze. It is indicative of the sometimes difficult path our students must take to navigate through our education system. To the students, teachers, and parents in the audience from QRC and SAGS, your presence is especially important to us in light of tonight's topic. Parents and teachers, thank you for your foresight and your dedication to developing young persons in a holistic manner. They must be given opportunities for exposure to high caliber intellectual discourse, fresh insights and out of the box thinking, which we hope will inspire them to greatness. I also extend a warm welcome to the members of the public who have joined us via live stream on the bank's website. We are delighted that you've all taken the time to be our guests this evening as we continue to honor our first prime minister's legacy by featuring education a subject that was close to his heart. We reached out to Dr. Nagera, Pedro, who was recommended as a feature speaker by Dr. Williams's daughter, Mrs. Erica Williams Connell. She was impressed by his work on education in the US and his dynamism and candor when delivering to audiences. We know that he will not disappoint us tonight. No pressure. I kindly ask that you put your mobile phones on silent Please note that videotaping of the event is not allowed. You can look forward to viewing the event on the bank's YouTube channel from next week. I now invite the governor of the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Alvin Hilaire, to deliver opening remarks and to introduce our distinguished speaker for tonight's lecture. Governor. Thanks, Nicole. Let me start by saying, wow, wow, and wow. 
I mean, look at the set, look at the spoken word by Idris. It is really amazing and truly wonderful start to the occasion today. And I want to commend the staff members and all those who put this thing together. It's really remarkable. Thank you very much. Now, I am an excitable person generally, so, and tonight even more so for me personally, professionally, and the central bank dealing with the topic of education. It brings me back to my good old days growing up as a youth in, in the, the second plannings in Duncan Street, Port of Spain, and having to focus on education. And I have to give a a real tribute to the teachers at Nelson Street Boys RC and to St. Mary's College for my formative years. So I know sometimes we do things and we don't think about the educators who groom us and who look towards what we will contribute in later life. Of course, also we have our parents and I was privileged to, to grow up under a strict disciplinarian, my mother, and who kept us in line. So um, everybody know that you don't mess with Miss Annie's children and her education. So uh, I want to pay tribute to her. We have my sister here, Arlene, who, is, who, is, who would have gone through that, and my bigger sister, Annette, who is watching online. So hello, Annette. Um, so it is important for us to focus on our education because this is what is a great level and it's what will make us uh, leaders of tomorrow. Uh, so I just want to start with that. So I know my, my staff sometimes panic when I go off course and they don't want me to extempo too much, so let me just get back to the, to the matter of hand. So in terms of the salutations, uh, Minister of Education, Mr. Anthony Garcia and Mrs. Garcia, members of the cabinet, of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, the Chief Secretary, Tobago House of Assembly, Mr. Kelvin Charles and Mrs. Catherine Charles, Your Excellencies, members of the Diplomatic Corps, Dr. Pedro Noguera, our distinguished lecturer, and your sons, Joaquin and Antonio, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and students and those listening to us online. On behalf of the Board of Directors, Management and Staff of the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago, it is my very great pleasure to welcome you to the 32nd Dr. Eric Williams Memorial Lecture. We've been at, at it at some, for some time. We appreciate and are honored tonight by the presence of those who I mentioned before. <laughs> A very warm welcome to all of you. Thank you for taking the time to join as for this, one of the bank's major public outreach events, physically at the bank's premises here tonight or virtually online. We consider this annual lecture a true gift of inspiration for our society. Many of you attending this event would have been in this auditorium before, listening to distinguished lectures that discuss aspects of Dr. Williams' work and legacy, as well as a wide variety of topics of importance for debate and discussion in Trinidad and Tobago and the wider Caribbean. A couple of years ago, we heard from Sir Hilary Beckles when he gave a passionate presentation on the university sector and economic development in the Caribbean. And many of you would have been here for last year's lecture when Dr. Carrie Fraser spoke brilliantly on Shagaramas and the Caribbean identity with specific emphasis on the diplomatic legacy of Dr. Williams. In this edition of the Distinguished Lecture Series, we focus on education and society. The subject of education is one that has engaged and at times troubled many of us, parents, educators, and students who care deeply about our nation's present and future. We heard from actor and spoken word artist Idris Salim at the start of tonight's program, speaking with passion about how our education system is losing relevance for many of our children. Our Ministry of Education, too, is constantly working on ways to refine the system to address our specific needs. 
We all know Dr. Williams' famous words to school children on the eve of independence. You carry the future of Trinidad and Tobago in your school bags. And while this continues to be true, we must be able to adjust and recalibrate how we look at education so that in a dynamic, complicated, and ever more connected world, we meet the needs of all our children and exceed our goals for the future of our nation. Moreover, the central bank and national financial literacy programs financial education drivers encapsulated in our frequent quotation from the mighty Sparrow himself. From over 50 years ago, to young students, to earn tomorrow, you've got to learn today. With these thoughts in mind, it is my great pleasure this evening to say a few words of introduction about our presenter, Dr. Pedro Noguera. Dr. Noguera is a sociologist, born in the US, the son of a Jamaican mother and Trinbagonian father, so we'll claim him tonight, whose diverse family background includes Tobago, Venezuela, Panama, Barbados, Guyana, and Haiti, making him a true Caribbean man. Currently, Dr. Noguera is Distinguished Professor of Education at the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies at UCLA. His research focuses on the ways in which schools are influenced by social and economic conditions, demographic trends in the US, and regional and global developments. He is a sought after presenter and has spoken on topics such as, are we failing our children? We can't wait for permission to do the right thing, and education for a changing society, which are currently all available online. Dr. Noguera is the author of 12 books, his most recent being Race, Equity, and Education, The Pursuit of Equality in Education 60 Years After Brown, and he has published over 200 articles and monographs. As if that were not enough, he serves on the boards of numerous US national and uh, local institutions, including the Economic Policy Institute, the Broader Boulder Approach, and the Nation Magazine, and is a regular commentator on education on several national media outlets in the US. He has written for the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Dallas Morning News, and Huffington Post. I don't know if he has time to do anything else, but he, he has previously served as a tenured professor and holder of ed endowed chairs at New York University, Harvard University, and the University of California, Berkeley. From 2009 to 2012, Dr. Noguera served as a trustee for the State University of New York as an appointee of the governor. In 2014, he was elected to the National Academy of Education. He recently has received awards from the Center for the Advanced Study of the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University, from the National Association of Secondary Principals, and from the McSilver Institute at New York University for his research and advocacy focused on fighting poverty. His record speaks for itself. And this evening, it is my great pleasure and honor to invite Dr. Pedro Noguera to deliver the 32nd Dr. Eric Williams Memorial Lecture on the theme, Education, Economic Diversity, and the Future of Trinidad and Tobago, Prospects and Challenges in the 21st Century. Join me, join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Noguero to the stage. Good evening. Cabinet Ministers, Chief Secretary of the Tobago House of the Assembly, members of the Diplomatic Corps, Governor of the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Alvin Hilaire, and his wife, Ms. Sheila Hilaire, Deputy Governor Dr. Sandra Sukram and other members of the Board of Directors, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It is truly an honor to be here and to have the pleasure and privilege of delivering this 32nd lecture in honor of Dr. Williams. Uh, I have deep roots in Trinidad, uh, so deep that not only did I bring my two sons, but I brought a brother and a sister who live here. And, uh, and my roots are so deep that uh, they even connect to Dr. Williams himself. We married into the family, and, uh, and so I feel a very strong connection very much at home, and I want to thank all of you for joining us this evening. I wanted to make sure you could see that. Uh, <clears throat> I thought a lot about my visit and uh, the message uh, that I needed to share with you, uh, because although I, I haven't been to Trinidad as often as I would like, I often get reports and hear news and the developments and much of what I hear concerns me. 
about the quality of life in the state of the country. Uh, and as a proud person of Trinidadian heritage, so proud that when Trinidad defeated the United States and preventing them from entering the World Cup, I was one of the few that was celebrating, even though it didn't mean that Trinidad would be in the World Cup. <laughs> Nonetheless, it showed great fortitude and, and a lot of character on the part of this country. And, and so to know that the country in many ways is suffering, that many of its residents are not fully participating in a country that is wealthy in many respects, disturbs me because it tells me that our potential as a nation, a potential that Dr. Williams was the first to till as the leader, uh, is not being realized. And I know from my own work that education is the key to realizing a better future for all Trinidadian and Tobagonian people. And so it's with that spirit in mind that I come to share this message. I want to start by saying that anyone who has studied the life of Dr. Williams knows how important education was to him. Because long before becoming a statesman and entering politics, he was an established scholar. In fact, he could have easily lived a life, as I do in the academy, where it's much easier than the rough and tumble of politics. But he chose to do battle for his country, politically that is, uh, to make the case for independence, and not just for Trinidad, but for the entire Caribbean, because he was also one of the leading spokespeople for Caribbean unity, for the West Indian Federation. And he chose to not only make education a priority for the new nation, but health and other services that were essential to creating an equitable democratic society. And so when we think about that legacy and we think about what he's accomplished and what he accomplished for this country, um, a country that is diverse, ethnically, religiously, a country that is uh, endowed with um, great resources, a country that is uh, an example for many throughout the world of what is possible when people from different backgrounds work together for a common vision. We know that the promise has a ways to go. Because as we travel this country, and I get to travel, um, and I did even a little today, what we see is the uneven nature of development. Uh, and this is not unique by any means to Trinidad. The United States, the still, in some ways, the world's richest country, uh, is also one of the most unequal countries in the world. I live in a city, Los Angeles, that has the largest homeless population in the United States. And if you travel in the streets of downtown Los Angeles, you feel as though you're entering the third world, because in many ways you are. But we can do better than the United States. And that, to me, is where education becomes so critical, because it is not possible to create a society that's equitable and democratic unless we ensure that all members of the society participate fully in education. We know that, like the United States, Trinidad is also threatened by growing economic inequality. And the cost of that inequality are a rise in crime and desperation and a deterioration in the quality of life which all of us witness and hear stories about each day which add to the fear that permeates the society. We know that with respect to health and the condition of young people in the country, and even with respect to the traffic in the country, which has only gotten worse, that the quality of life is in many ways not what it should be or could be. And while we are still lucky compared to many other countries, we know that that luck could easily change. Because when you're dependent upon a finite resource like petroleum, you know that your future eventually will be in jeopardy. And so I want you to think tonight about the future of Trinidad and Tobago and what it means to create a society that is fully inclusive, a society where all members get to participate fully. I want you to think about the challenges confronting Trinidad and Tobago, islands that will feel and are already feeling the direct consequences of climate change. Whereas in the United States, there is still an active debate over whether or not it's real. Hopefully that is not occurring in this territory. 
Greenland is melting. The world just experienced the hottest roar, um, uh, year on record. And we know that climate change will have perilous consequences for many parts of the world, not just islands, but coastal regions. It's impacting the weather right now, where there's too much rain in some parts of the world and too little in other parts. And we know that simply wishing it away will not solve the problem or hoping that future generations will do a better job at confronting it. We know that young people in Trinidad and Tobago are faced with a number of exclusionary factors that prevent them from fully participating. And I must be clear that we know that it is still the case that our best and brightest in many cases continue to do well, to excel, but this is also a country where they also must leave because too often our best and brightest young people cannot find work and opportunity in this country and must seek it abroad. And we have to ask ourselves, can a country that continues to send so many of its talented people abroad ever completely fulfill its potential? We know that there's restricted access to secondary education in the schools, to high quality education, and that high levels of unemployment, particularly amongst young people where it ranks as high as 30% for those 15 to 19, poses a great threat to all of us. Because those who are idle and unable to fulfill their potential and participate fully in society, often find themselves at risk to themselves and to others. And so as we contemplate the challenges we face, we have to think about what role schools can and should play as a resource for solving our society's problems. We know that right now, in most countries throughout the world, with the exception of a small number, it is demography that predicts how well our children will do. That is, rather than producing equity in our society, our schools too often produce inequity. Because access to high quality education is not universal. If it were, it would not matter where we sent our children to school. It should be that if you live in Tunapuna or in Port of Spain or in San Fernando, it doesn't matter where. The schools are good quality. And you can be sure your children will be safe and challenged and stimulated. But we know that's not the case. I often say the most equitable system I know in the world today is the New York subway system. Four million people a day rely on that system. Regardless of where you get on, you pay the same price. It's relatively safe. Relatively, and I use that carefully, clean. You don't mind rats. But it doesn't matter where you enter, you pay the same price. And it's one of the few institutions in the world where you will see the very rich standing right next to the very poor, relying on the same system for service. Now, it's a system that's increasingly in shambles, but it's equitably in shambles. Everyone suffers from it. Our schools need to be at least as good because it cannot be that your birthright, where you live, who you are, who your parents were, determines what kind of education you receive. Because when that's the case, it means that many of our young people will be doomed to a life where they cannot reach their potential simply because the opportunities were not present. And so I want you to think about what it would take for education to play a role in addressing some of the pressing challenges facing the country today. Again, if you were a person who did well in school, it may be hard for you to know and think about how it might need to change. So don't think about the straight A students tonight. Think about the individuals you knew and know now who are extremely intelligent, who are bright, but school did not work for them. School wasn't the place where they were challenged and stimulated. They were bored. They were restless. They experienced failure. Their failure becomes society's failure. Who do we incarcerate? Almost always those we fail to educate. And the cost of incarceration are far greater than the cost of education. And so I want you to consider the purposes of education. In all societies at all times, education has two purposes. 
One is the practical goal of integration, making sure that young people have the skills and knowledge they will need to participate fully in society so that they can earn a living and hopefully be productive members, so that they have the knowledge and the skills required to vote intelligently, to distinguish between fake and real news. Very important, but not sufficient. Because education must also be where we look for change. This generation of children will inherit the problems of their parents. They will be the ones that will have to figure out how to contend with global warming, how to contend with disease and crime, economic inequality. The education that we've given them is not good enough to solve that problem. They must be critical thinkers. They must have the ability to apply their imagination to think up new scenarios to address the problems we face now. If there's to be any progress, it will have to come from a mindset that prevents our children from being overwhelmed by fear of what we know now so they can imagine new possibilities. How do we ensure that that education is available to our children? Well, here's a few things we know already. The World Bank has known this for many years. The most effective way we have to reduce poverty in the world today is through education, particularly the education of women. Educated women have fewer children. Educated women earn more money, which benefits families. And unlike many men, educated women spend their money on their families. And so an investment in women is an investment in our future. What are we doing to ensure that girls are getting the education they need to participate fully in our society? We know that when we make strategic investments in people, in economic opportunity, that that too is the best way to reduce inequality and poverty. And we have examples of nations that have done just that, that have chosen to invest in people rather than simply perpetuating the same patterns and consequently creating societies that are more equitable. And I could cite places like Canada and New Zealand, but I could also cite places like Cuba and Sri Lanka that have made these kinds of commitments to education that show us that it is possible to create a more equitable society without leaving anyone behind. Finally, we know that crime and the cost of incarceration can in fact be counted through education. That people who are educated are less likely to return to prisons. And the research is very clear that when you educate a person and ensure that they are skilled, they are gonna be more able to contribute to the society and to themselves. We should be turning our prisons into schools and universities. Too more often that's not the case. Too often, our prisons produce hardened criminals who come out better prepared to engage in crime. And so I want you to think about what could be if we invested in education that cultivated curiosity, and in an education that encouraged critical thinking so that we could overcome our fears. I was talking to the governor of the, the bank this evening because he spent time in Sierra Leone and Guinea, which along with Liberia were the nations affected by the Ebola outbreak. Think about the Ebola outbreak. Just three years ago, it was predicted that we would have a pandemic on our hands, that within three months, one million people across the globe would contract the disease. Today, Ebola is contained. Not eliminated, but totally contained. And there's still no vaccine. How did that happen? Well, as you may recall, when the outbreak occurred, there were some who called for quarantine. Quarantine those countries, keep the people there. Don't allow them to travel. Don't let them in your countries. We had a nurse that came from Liberia to Newark Airport and the governor of, Newark, of, of New Jersey put her in a tent in quarantine for several weeks. The fear was that great that the disease would spread. 
right? While others were fleeing, some said, no, the way to solve this is to go to those countries, to educate the people about how to deal with this disease. One of those individuals was a leading epidemiologist who happened to come from Liberia, the very neighborhood that was ground zero for the disease. Dr. Masoka Fala, he said, if people don't trust you, they'll hide the body and you'll never know, and Ebola will spread. They've got to trust you, but we don't have the luxury of time. And so within a few weeks, they created a public health system where none was. They relied on trust to educate people and to counter the fear. Now, I bring up this example because it's rare that we celebrate our victories, but we should celebrate the victory of Ebola, shouldn't we? But we should also understand how that victory was possible. Because trust is a resource that costs very little to generate. Trust and education can save lives, and we have numerous examples that when we cultivate a sense of agency in people, a belief that they have the power to control their lives and make wiser choices, that they can, in fact, change their circumstances. And I'm not naive about this because I know that there are real obstacles. There are structural and there are cultural obstacles that get in the way for many of us that prevent us from achieving our potential. But I also know that throughout history, there have been examples of individuals who've used education and who've demonstrated agency in their lives. Now, one of the best examples I can think of is Harriet Tubman, who I'll come back to in a moment who, despite the fact that she was illiterate, literally freed more people from slavery than anyone in the history of the United States. She had agency, not to be confused with grit. Now, my colleague, Angela Duckworth, a psychologist at, U at uh, University of Pennsylvania, won a MacArthur Genius Award for her seminal research on grit. And I give her credit because I would say it's remarkable that you will get a genius award for saying people should work hard. I thought that was an old idea. I didn't know that was worthy of an award. But here's what I know. Working hard by itself does not get you very far. In fact, working hard without opportunity can leave you just tired and broke. Agency is not the same as grit. It includes grit. It includes effort. It includes persistence. But it also includes critical thinking strategizing about how to overcome barriers. It also includes the possibility of collective agency because sometimes it's not simply about what we do as individuals, but what we can accomplish collectively. And as we saw in West Africa and Liberia and elsewhere, when we are organized collectively to educate ourselves in our interest, great things are possible. And so I want you to think about what are we doing to cultivate agency? Harriet Tubman, as I said, was often underestimated. She was not even five feet tall. She was disabled. She had sleeping sickness. She would pass out sometimes. She used to cross-dress. And so people didn't assume that this woman, this small person, could be so dangerous until finally they realized, no, she's dangerous. In fact, sometimes she carries a gun. She became a spy for the Union Army. And when she retired later in life, living in Schenectady, New York, married to a man 30 years her junior, they asked her, Harriet, how did you manage to free so many people? She said, I could have freed so many more had they not been afraid. And so agency is real and the examples are also real. I saw that example when I was in South Africa just a few years ago, visiting Sapphire Roads Primary School. Sapphire Roads is in a township outside of Port Elizabeth. And the townships in South Africa, for those of you who haven't visited, are far more desolate than even the poorest communities we know here in Trinidad and Tobago. Because we're talking about sometimes thousands of people upon each other, living under desperate conditions. In this one community, over 50% of the children were orphans. Parents died of AIDS. And my friend, Bruce Dammons, featured here in this picture, was assigned to be the principal by the Ministry of Education. And he wisely realized when he got there that he'd been set up to fail. And so he wisely turned to the community. 
And he threw a party. He threw a, what he called a Thanksgiving party where they had food and music. And people came. And they asked, why are you throwing a party and thanking us? He says, well, I'm thanking you in advance for the help you're going to provide me. Because I can't fix the school by myself. And they explained the problems facing the community. And they said, well, we'll work with you. But the first thing we have to do is we have to stop the crime. The, this school is being uh, pillaged by youth in the neighborhood who are stealing everything that's not nailed down. Even the pipes can't bring in water because they've stolen the pipes. He said, I want to meet those young men. And he did. In South Africa, they call him Totsi. And he listened to their story and they explained their circumstances. They explained that they were out of work and desperate. They didn't have malice toward the school. They just were faced with very few choices. He said, why don't you work with me? You can provide security for my school. I'll give you free housing in exchange. Today, the school is safe because those who used to rob and pillage the school now protect it. He turned to the mothers. He said, you know, we have to do something to get kids back to school because children weren't showing up. Teachers were barely showing up. And they said to him, well, the children are hungry. They don't have enough to eat. Many of these kids are living on their own, have no parents. He said, why don't we feed them? Look at all the land we have here. Why don't we have a garden at this school? Today they do. They not only produce food, vegetables, they have goats and chickens. And it's a thriving garden staffed by the same parents at the school, the same mothers who also now feed, get enough to feed themselves and the community. They have classes for parents in the community on how to raise children because they know that many of the parents themselves are struggling. There's a clinic staffed by parents. And I visited the clinic. And I just discovered that all the parents there were untrained. I said, what do you do when children are actually sick? I said, well, usually we just give them a glass of water and tell them to lay down. I said, half the time it works. I said, when it doesn't work, we have to call a real nurse. But the point is they're not waiting for help. And the reason why they're not waiting for help is because help is not coming. They're taking matters into their own hand. And because they have, the children are back and the school is thriving. It is now one of 15 schools that is a model based at Nelson Mandela University in Port Elizabeth called the Community School that draws on the resources of communities to support schools because the government has failed to do its job. And I was there and I met with this leadership council. I kept asking, why do you volunteer at this school? And one of the women said, well, I wasn't doing anything anyway. And my children are here. And now because I'm here and we're here, this school is thriving and people like you come to visit. And while I was there, they were making signs to protest against the ministry because teachers had not been paid for several weeks. And the principal, Bruce Dammons, was also making his sign. I said, you're going to protest too? He said, absolutely. You know what happened to the last person from the ministry when they came to visit? They locked them in the closet. He said, I want the people to know I'm on their side. I don't work for the ministry. I work for the people. They have generated social capital to save themselves. They understand that power need not come merely from those with wealth and political power. It can come from people too. And so we need to figure out how to generate social capital in our communities, a sense of ownership over our schools because our children and their futures are at stake. Our schools must become assets to their communities, which means aside from offering the minimum in terms of education, they have to be places where our children know they're safe, where families know that they can receive assistance if they need it, where communities can take pride in knowing that that school is a beacon of hope. Because when this occurs, and when young people are connected to mentors who can open doors, great things are indeed possible. And so I want to give you some examples of schools like these. This individual in the picture, David Banks, is the founder of a school in the Bronx, Eagle Academy. David was an attorney in New York City, working in the criminal justice system, and he was tired of seeing so many young men locked up, locked up for crime and losing their lives to violence, gang violence. And he decided he was going to leave the law and go to education. He said, I want to create a school that's more powerful than the streets. 
first time I learned about Eagle Academy was on the subway. And those of you who've taken the subway in New York City know the worst time to take subway is when school lets out. Because it's usually very crowded and lots of noisy children. And there I was, headed uptown, and I see three young men with ties. Not like me, but with ties. And I see one offer his seat to a pregnant woman. And I assumed that they must be Mormons in the neighborhood. And I went to approach them and said, no, we're not Mormons. We are from Eagle Academy. I said, Eagle Academy? I said, yes, we're coming from the Museum of Natural History, headed back to the Bronx. I said, well, where's your teacher? I said, we know how to get to the Bronx ourselves. We do it every day. I said, well, who taught you to give up your seat like that? I said, well, that's the Eagle way. I said, the Eagle way. So I need to learn more about the Eagle way. And so I arranged a visit. And David gives me the tour, and then you should know that the school is located right next to the courthouse. So every morning you can see men in chains being arraigned in the courts. But this is a school that's a beacon of hope. And their strategy for countering the streets is to keep these young people so busy they have no time for gangs. So the school is open from 7 in the morning till 7 at night. And aside from offering the core subjects, they also offer things like fencing. And those who fence here know you should never fence in shorts. It's very dangerous. But it's not just fencing, it's martial arts, it's music, it's theater. Because the research shows that when young people are involved in music and theater and sports, they do better academically. And when they pair those young people with mentors who can introduce them to fields, then young people start to pursue their education and to grow up with a sense of confidence about who they are and where they're going. And here's a very basic truth about children, isn't it? Children who think they're going somewhere behave differently than children who think they're going nowhere. And so I got to see the robotics team in action. We have a program in the United States called US First where they have teams that develop robots and they compete with each other. And I was asked to be a judge. Now I know nothing about robots, but there I was at the Javits Center with over 3,000 young people competing. And I found out the young men from Eagle Academy had come in sixth place. Now, that wasn't good enough to go to the finals. Only the top three teams went to the finals. But I went to tell them the news, and they began to celebrate. I said, well, sixth place is good. They said, it's real good. I said, explain to me how you built the robot. And one of them took out his notes to explain the physics behind the robot. And I hadn't taken physics in a long time, so I was very impressed. I said, well, who helped you build the robot? They said, the first person to help us was our custodian. I said, the custodian helped you build a robot? They said, yes. He got us the parts. We don't know where he gets the parts from, but whenever we need parts, the custodian comes through. I said, who else helped you? They said, our science teacher. And there's a man sleeping in a chair. I said, wow, he looks out of it. And then he woke up. He said, I was up till 3 in the morning with these kids. I said, you guys were up till 3 in the morning? He said, these young men have been up every evening with me because I have the keys for the last three months, weekends. I said, you guys work evenings and weekends. Do you get paid? He said, no one gets paid. I said, why do you do it? Because he said, because of the passion they now have for what they're doing. I said, well, you're not going to get to go to the finals. What do you want to do next? And all 11 of these young men said they want to be mechanical engineers. Now, what's Fascinating about that is these are young men who come from neighborhoods where there are no mechanical engineers. It's hard to aspire to something you've never seen or been associated with, isn't it? Except that now they're in a school that actively cultivates those dreams and is not afraid of their energy. Because they know they work with young men and young men like to move. And so movement is a part of their learning. Active learning, not passive learning. Why? Because when they are allowed to interact and learn, they're actually learning the way they learn, rather than learning the way they are told to learn. And because they are, the school is thriving, and despite the numerous obstacles they face, because they haven't changed the conditions in the community or in their homes, what they have done is to create a school that promotes resilience. And so we need to learn from these examples. Because the data, particularly on black males, in the United States, also here in Trinidad, is disturbing. 
In every category we associate with failure, overrepresented. And in every category we associate with success, vastly underrepresented. How do you change that? Well, there are schools that are showing it can be changed. Schools like Eagle Academy, where the children actually will tell you it's cool to be smart. I got to go to the induction ceremony for new students entering ninth graders, which is run by the existing 12th graders, the seniors, run the induction ceremony and explain what the norms of the school are, the rules, the expectations, how to wear a tie. At the end of the ceremony that I attended, the Tuskegee Airmen showed up. These men were in the 80s and 90s, some of them in walkers, and they came onto the stage. And there was a standing ovation from the young people because they wanted them to know you are part of a legacy of excellence. And excellence is what is expected of you. And so I want to, you to think about what is the message we are sending to young people here in Trinidad and Tobago. Are we cultivating excellence? Are we providing access to the means to use education to change their lives? Are we cultivating their curiosity? Here's one thing we all know. All children are naturally curious, aren't they? What is the most common question you've ever heard from a three-year-old? Why? They want to know, don't they? Why is a higher order question? Why do I have to take a bath? You have to engage them about sanitation. Why do I have to eat my vegetables? You have to discuss nutrition. Why is the sky blue? Now we are really getting into tough territory. <laughs> that desire to know, that desire to learn has to be nurtured, has to be encouraged. And that's what schools should do. How often at the end of the day do your children come home and say to you, I was inspired today. That was a hell of a day I had. I can't wait to go back. We laugh because we know too often that's not what happens. That's not what we hear. I was visiting a school in Los Angeles. It's a school, 100% of the children are poor. 100% of the children Hispanic. 40% of the children undocumented. That means they're living in fear as fugitives. Has that fourth highest graduation rate in all of the city. It's the only school in Los Angeles where the students evaluate their teachers. I met with the teachers and I said, what's it like to work? And they said, it's great. This is a school, very little turnover from teachers. They said, we work together. We plan lessons together. I said, what's the hardest thing about working here? The feedback from the students. They don't hold back. They really tell us. And one girl told me, I have a teacher who hasn't talked to me for two years. Because I told her she was disorganized but she's gotten better and we're on speaking terms. I asked the students, I said, how often are you inspired by what you learn? They said, every day. I said, I don't believe you. What did you learn yesterday? Girl shut up her hand. She said, yesterday we learned about the forced sterilization of women that was occurring in the United States in the 1930s. I was so disturbed, I went home and talked to my father about it. We spent two hours discussing it, doing more research to understand how this could have occurred because of eugenics. You know what happens when our children get a good education? They want more. It feeds a hunger to learn. That's what we should be doing in our schools today. So to address the challenges facing our society and the world, our children will have to be critical thinkers. And they're gonna to have to learn to use their creativity and their imagination to solve problems. The problems have to be part of the curriculum. Our education has to be relevant to our lives and to our society. Otherwise, we will continue to see young people who show up in body but not in mind, who are not stimulated and challenged, and even if they are succeeding, do not have that intrinsic desire to continue to learn on their own. So I want you to think outside the box with me for a moment, because I know that so often we are caught up in doing things the way we have that we sometimes don't stop to ask, are we going about it the right way? Is there another way we could approach this? That's a question I often ask. Positive deviance has been shown to be a very effective way to generate solutions to perplexing problems. 
Some of you may know Chicago has been in the midst of a crime wave that has befuddled many people. The, the murder rates are rising even as they've declined in big cities like New York and Los Angeles. The largest housing project right now in the United States, in New York City, in Queens, has not had a murder in over a year. I know the individuals who've been leading the effort to keep peace, they're all ex-convicts. Because they, fired, they decided that the best way to maintain peace is to empower those who might otherwise undermine it, to have them be the peace builders, to train them, to educate them, to employ them. And it's worked. And so we brought them to Chicago to try to share the message of what's working. But we know that too often, even when people are confronted with what works, their ability to imagine how it could work here is limited. So limited that they are not even willing to try things that are cost-free. A colleague of mine decided that he wanted to do something about the murder rate in Richmond, California, which had one of the highest murder rates in the country. Working with the uh, epidemiologists or criminologists, they decided who are the individuals most likely to commit crimes. It turned out there were about 75 individuals between the ages of 16 to 25. So let's invite them into a meeting. And they did. And instead of threatening them with jail time, they listened to them about their lives. They started something called the Shooters Project. And they decided once again, they were going to work with the people most at risk to help them stabilize their lives so that they could become emissaries for peace in their community. And crime and violence in Richmond plummeted within a year. Within a year. And so when we look at answers like these, then we have to realize that there are other ways in which to approach some of our problems. One of the things that impressed me when I visited South Africa was going to Robben Island. And those of you who visited know Robben Island was where all the top leadership of the ANC and the Pan-African Congress were held, including Nelson Mandela. Mandela spent 21 years in Robben Island, seven years in solitary. I was given a tour of the facility by a former inmate and explained that the prison was designed to destroy those who were held there. It was decided, he said, they created this to break us, and it became known as our university. I said, how could a prison become a university? He said, well, those who were educated started to educate us. People like Dennis Brutus, the, the poet, and people like Nelson Mandela, the attorney, he said, Mandela was so smart, he went over the guards. So there was one guard, this one featured here in the picture, whose family was losing their home, being evicted. And because Mandela was a lawyer, he counseled him on how to deal with the eviction. And in the process, turned an Africana racist into an ally who began to bring books and information into the prisons so that the inmates could be educated and so that the next generation of leadership could be developed. If you can turn prisons into universities, what can we do with our schools? What is preventing our schools from being places that promote the kind of knowledge and education that will allow our young people to contribute to solving the problems that they face in our society and the world? Paulo Freire, the Brazilian educator, person I've sought guidance and inspiration from over the years when grappling with democracy and the fact that millions of Brazilians were left out by virtue of their circumstance, learned that it's not good enough to master the mechanics of literacy and math. We have to learn to read the world. That if we want young people to really be participants in society, they have to understand how to use knowledge and education to solve real problems in their lives. And so that kind of problem-solving education is what we must bring to Trinidad and Tobago. And I'm so glad the Minister of Education is here because I know that the potential, the ability is here right now to make this happen. Because I see it happening in many places. I was called upon a few years ago to visit a 
school in Oakland, California. Superintendent told me this school was one of the worst schools in the, in the district. It had very, very low scores. He said, please, go talk to the teachers. So I go to talk to the teachers, and all they want to talk about is how badly behaved the children are. They, they act out. They're angry. They fight. They're disruptive. And after a few minutes of hearing this, I stopped them. I said, let me ask you a question. I said, suppose you're going to teach in a foreign country. What would you want to know before you went there? And they didn't know why I asked the question, but they played along and they said, you need to know about the history and the culture and politics and the economy. I said, why? They said, because if you don't know those things, you might find that you're not really able to be an effective educator because you don't understand the context. I said, okay, so context is important. I said, yes. I said, well, how many of you know anything about this community where you work? And although some of them had worked there for over 20 years, they didn't even know where the supermarkets were. They didn't know if there was a library there. I said, let's go. Let's go on a bus and take a tour. We took a tour of the community. We saw the supermarket and the library and the parks. We even saw some of the children playing, waved surprised to see their teachers. We got back to the school, and almost every teacher said the same thing. They said, why did you do that? Those people were staring at us. We felt like tourists. We thought you were going to help us. And you have us going on bus rides. It wasn't what I expected. But a new teacher on the bus trip said, I saw something very interesting. I said, what's that? She said, I saw that many of the homes in this area have gardens. I said, well, why is that interesting? She said, well, I teach environmental science. And now my suspicion is that the soil is toxic. It's contaminated with lead because this is an industrial area. And if people are eating the vegetables from those gardens, the children are probably being contaminated with lead. I said, well, what are you going to do with that? She said, well, I teach environmental science. I can do a whole unit around the effects of lead in the environment. So her colleagues are looking at her like, who is she? Where'd they get this teacher? And I decide I'm going to sit in the class and I sit in and I observe as the children learn about the effects of contaminants from the air and how it gets into the soil and what happens when children eat vegetables that are exposed with lead and water exposed with lead. And then they get kits to test the soil in the community and to plot the areas that are toxic and start to make correlations and discover, lo and behold, that where there were once foundries and factories, the soil is, in fact, contaminated. And they produce a map showing where the toxicity is greatest. And the whole time that the students are involved in this research, there's never a disturbance, there's never any trouble. They are totally engaged. At the end of the unit, Teacher's very pleased at how successful it's been. She has to tell the class she's got to go on. And boy raises her hand. She said, what's going on? She says, he said, we can't go on. I said, why not? He said, because now we have to warn the people about the lead. She said, warn the people? She said, Pedro, how do I warn the people? I said, I don't know how to warn the people either. I said, but I do know the county health commissioner. So together we went to the commissioner and explained about the research the students had done. And he was shocked because the only thing he'd heard about those students was how bad they were and how bad the school was. He said, I'd like to come and hear them present their research. I said, let's go together. And you should see the young people shine when they get to explain their research and show the maps they've created of their community and describe what they've learned. And the commissioner is so taken, he says, well, I'm going to send out a notice warning every neighborhood, every resident in this neighborhood about the dangers in the soil and I will offer anyone who wants it free topsoil for their garden. And the young people cheer. What did they really learn? They learned more than simply how to prepare for a test, didn't they? They learned about the power of knowledge to solve real problems. In fact, some of them will now want to become scientists because they now understand its utility, its value to their lives. What are we doing to inspire this generation of Trinidadian and Tobagonian children. Think of the potential. Trinidad has such a proud legacy. Last night we were spending time thinking about all the many artists and intellectuals and scientists and writers who've come from this country. Imagine if there were schools like a Beryl McBurney School of the Arts in Woodbrook that was using the arts to engage with them. We know, and the research is very clear, the arts is one of the most effective ways to engage. What about a school 
of ecotourism in the National Reserve in Tobago, or Naipaul Loveless School of Creative Writing and Tranquility, the same Tranquility Government School that Naipaul attended. We can transform our schools. If you can transform prisons, you can transform schools. And so my challenge to you tonight is to think about the possibilities. Education can be a resource for a better future. But chances are it's not the schools we have now. Right now, we expect young people to learn the way we teach. And if they can't do it, we blame them. I would say in too many of our schools, we don't teach children the way they learn. Most children don't learn like this, sitting still and listening to someone talk. They learn by doing. They learn by interacting. They learn by making mistakes. And ultimately, they learn through mastery. We need to make sure that we create schools that are worthy of this country schools that can help solve the problems facing this country. We take great pride in so many things. In the United States, we take so much pride in football, basketball. That's why they're so upset about them kneeling at the national anthem. Football is so sacred. How could you kneel? As if kneeling were an act of you know, disregard. But I go to cities where they invest public dollars in football stadiums and no dollars in their schools. The future of our societies will be determined by what happens in our schools. That's how important it is. And so as you think about the future, I'm going to leave you with the words of Dr. Williams on education. He says, to increase student engagement and ownership of learning, we should give students opportunities to do meaningful work, work that makes a difference locally, nationally, and globally. That is within our reach. Let me close with one Final story to illustrate the potential. My grandmother lived in the South Bronx off of Willis Avenue in the housing projects for almost 20 years. It's part of the Bronx that burned in the 1970s. It burned because the landlords were burning the property to collect the insurance, and so it looked like a war zone. I learned a few years ago that PS 138. That's public school number 138. That's, we have fancy names for our schools in New York. Was a high performing school. I said, I have to visit this school because they're, they're serving the children from those same projects in the poorest neighbor of the United States. How could this be a high performing school? So I go and I'm greeted by a little girl. She says, I'm your tour guide. I said, okay, let's go. And the first thing she does, she wants me to show me the proof. She takes me to the room where the awards are. And the articles that have been written about the school are on the wall to let me know this has been happening for many years at the school. It's not a new thing. Greatness is a part of their history. Then she takes me to classrooms, explains that there's an ongoing competition at the school for who can read the most books. The most books, they read real books. I said, what do you get? They said, maybe we get pizza at the end of the month. But the joy is in the books. And they write, they're writers, they're writing poetry, and I had to buy several copies of their poems. I said, this is a, an amazing school, a beautiful school. She says, you haven't seen anything yet. Let me take you upstairs. And we go upstairs and I learn the only museum in New York City dedicated to the history of the Bronx is in their school. But it's not locked away in a classroom. It's in the hallways. And there's a picture of the Bronx family, German family, spelled their name with a K owned a large farm, picture of the Yankees from the 1920s, picture of Joe Lewis when he fought Max Schmeling, the first album produced by Daniel Byrd, the jazz artist in glass, and his student, Willie Colon, all on display, all within easy reach of children. So the first thing that comes to my mind is that this could easily be vandalized. It could be broken or taken. So I turned to the little girl and I asked her, I said, aren't you worried? Aren't the school worried that this museum could be damaged by the children. And the girl looks at me like I'm some kind of sicko. She says, I don't know about the schools you go to normally. <laughs> but it's this school. Children value their education. Why do I ask the question? Because I'm so accustomed to going to schools where children are treated like inmates in prisons. I was visiting a school like that in Los Angeles, a middle school. Science classroom with no science equipment. 
And I asked the science teacher, where's the science equipment? She said, I lock it up. I said, you lock it up? She said, yes, I lock it up so they don't break it. I said, well, do they ever get to use it? She said, occasionally, if they're good. And she reminded me of one of those people. You ever met someone who, lock, who keeps their furniture covered? Like they're waiting for someone special to come? And you know if it's covered when you come, you're not the special guest. <laughs> What makes those children so special? Is it the education they receive, the culture that's been created? Absolutely. Here's what we know, poverty is not a learning disability. There's absolutely no evidence that because people are poor, they cannot learn. Let us not use excuses to keep us from doing what is within our reach and in our interest. Trinidad deserves excellent schools. I wish you all the very best in creating them. Thank you. I don't even know what to say. Um, I told you no pressure. I was awesome, awesome, awesome. We feel inspired. And we want to celebrate that victory by presenting to you a token from the bank. So this is where I give directions. So gentlemen, Governor and Dr. Noguera, if you can come forward onto the stage so the paparazzi can get proper pictures. Honorable Minister Garcia, we are so happy that you're here and we know you came representing the Prime Minister and we'd like to present this token to you, a token of appreciation for your time and your presence. <laughs> Governor, can you please present this token to Mrs. Garcia? James is coming to take it from us, so. I'd like to ask Dr. Sukram, Deputy Governor, to come center. And she'll make a presentation to Assemblyman Kelvin Charles, Chief Secretary, Tobago House of Assembly. You can come forward. Thank you for coming. We who work here with this governor know how much time he spends here working with us. And his wife obviously understands that and makes some sacrifice. And we just want to appreciate her. Sheila Hille, Mrs. Sheila Hille can come forward. Thank you very much. Look at my sharp young people. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much. At this point in time, we are coming close to the end and I really have the pleasure of inviting one of my colleagues to the stage, the Inspector of Financial Institutions, Mr. Patrick Solomon, with a somewhat famous name. So if we can just warmly welcome Patrick to the podium. Thank you, Nicole. Nicole said it. I was sitting there taking notes, but I thought all good things must come to an end. I could have stayed here whole night listening to the Professor. He had some relevant He had some relevant examples. And you know once somebody is comfortable with what they do, it is easy to communicate. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is my responsibility to bring our lecture to a close and to express our appreciation to everyone who has made tonight's event a success. To Governor Alvin Hillier 
and Mrs. Sheila Hillier. Thank you for hosting this very captivating lecture in honor of Dr. Eric Williams. We would like to express our sincerest gratitude to our feature speaker, Dr. Pedro Nogueira, for most informative and thought-provoking presentation. We are truly appreciative of your invaluable contribution to the legacy of Dr. Eric Williams. We need to give special thanks to the family of Dr. Williams, who continue to support this lecture series. We thank all our suppliers and everyone who helped make this event so memorable. The builders of the set, could you give them an applause for the... <clears throat> and our in-house designers for creating this maze and Mr. Salim for his spoken word performance that was so appropriate for setting the tone of the lecture. Thank you to those who are providing catering and entertainment services for the reception and to the team who work on this outstanding opening production. Thank you, our guests, for your overwhelming response and your undivided attention. That was easy tonight because of the lecture that we had. We could not have such an event without your presence. To the schools in particular, thank you for encouraging your students to participate in our lecture series. We hope that, you, that we have enriched your lives and encouraged your interest in history and the future of our country as it pertains to education. Who knows? Maybe you may be the catalyst for change to the education system as we know it. And we got a lot of ideas of what we can do to make sure that the education is relevant and utilized. I would also like to thank at this point the Senior Manager, Human Resources, Industrial and External Relations, Mrs. Nicole Crooks, and the External Relations Department for the efficient and successful coordination of this evening's proceedings. <laughs> Last but not least, we are tru truly grateful to the support services, legal, contract, and corporate secretariat services, and the Security Department for your assistance in organizing this event. As we are celebrating our 42nd Republic Day on Monday, 24th of September, on behalf of Governor Hillier, the Board of Directors, management and staff of the bank, I extend warm greetings to you and your families. We have come to the end of the official part of the evening. I now invite you to the reception. Please remain seated as we allow the persons in the first two rows, stage center, to exit the auditorium. Our ushers will then guide you to the main concourse for the reception. Please enjoy the rest of the evening's proceedings. I now invite the first two rows to proceed out of the auditorium. Thank you.